Oh, hello. I wasn't expecting me either, and here I am. And here you are, again. What's wrong with both of us? Welcome back to Kevin Pollack's chat show. I am always am not chat show. I am something else. Uh, my name is Sam Levine. Uh, I'm very grateful to Kevin for, I guess, just not feeling up to it today, as it turns out. And that's why I'm here. He's in Toronto. He's in Toronto. I'm teasing. No, Kevin is working. Here's the thing. Kevin, um, I, don't, I think he fell on a horseshoe. He had one of those accidents that gets people into proctologists' offices. And, uh, and it's been going well for him. And he's got a pilot that got picked up. He's got, I've lost count of the movies he's either working on or writing and directing. But basically, Kevin is too busy to do anything, including sleep, from now until the middle of 2018. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that he uh, lets me do this. And I'm also very grateful for the small roles he might not be giving me in any of those projects. Jesus Christ. Right? <laughs> what an intro. It, that's how I intro Kevin. Yeah. Uh, I love you, Kevin. Get well soon. Um, there is no, there's no preamble today. I don't have the wonderful Jamie Foxx with me. Uh, I do, of course, as always, have the wonderful Jason McIntyre up in the bird's nest. Yeah. And he's got family in town. Hello! Uh, and we've still, still got Dr. Kenny Chen and the fantastic Mike Duman, but that's it. I'm not going to waste anyone's time because I am very excited about my guest today. He's a man who needs no introduction, but I wrote him a nice one anyway. Wow. <clears throat> Our guest today is the epitome of the actor's actor. His is a career that spans stage, television, and screen over the course of the last 60 years. He's worked with the likes of Oliver Stone, Tony Scott, Clint Eastwood, Gary Marshall, and Brian De Palma, just to name a few. That was in one year. In addition to his growing list of acting credits, which is fast approaching the 150 mark, he's also an accomplished writer, producer, and director. But perhaps most importantly, he's one of the select few actors who've had the privilege of calling me son. <laughs> Please welcome Saul Rubinek. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's nice to hear about how Kevin is working, though, just before we start. Right? Interview. Yeah. Right? Other no, actors stop. being busy really no. is inspiring. Mm-hmm. Well, that never, me, but, it never well, bothers me. No, no, it no, doesn't? No. I've never wished anyone ill. You're an accomplished liar, though. So. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, you know, so That's definitely would know true. what you're saying. Well, no, I don't mind when Kevin works, because ultimately it only means potentially work for me. Potentially. That's good. That's good. And that's better than, you know. It depends on how you, you, you guys are getting along. Is that what it that's is? That's true. It's very, let's, it's let's very touch Kevin and go. Now. It's very touch and go. <laughs> um, well, no, I know you and Kevin have something of a connection. Through my parents. Through your folks. Um, yeah. Um, Kevin was in Barry Levinson's movie, Avalon. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend Matt Craven had been in, in Tin Man, which was directed by Barry. And uh, Barry would, knew he was doing Avalon, which is about his own people in Baltimore. Oh, sure. And he was looking for authentic, you know, Yiddish-speaking actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, Matt, who knew my parents, said, you know, you should meet Saul's dad, because my dad had been in Yiddish theater in Poland when right. he was young, before the war. And he did, but he also met my mom. And my mom was not an actress. And then they, he flew, uh, Barry flew my parents to New York, I remember. Mm -hmm. And for about a week, it was touch and go whether or not it was going to be my mother or Joan Plowright playing <laughs> the lead yeah. because my mother was the role. And, you know, he's very cleverly cast an actor in the uh -huh. role. And, uh, and eventually, about, I don't know, about two, somewhere along the line, or somewhere about a year later, Joan Plowright actually played my mother. In, <laughs> yeah, in uh, Driving Miss Daisy was a pilot, fortuitously shot the day of the L.A. riots. Oh, wow. So you could see why it might not have been picked up. Sure. There's, um, so, yeah, so I went to visit the set. I was doing a small Canadian movie in Montreal, and I wanted to visit my parents. I went down to Baltimore, and I went to this big Hollywood movie set, and there was uh, Kevin and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and my parents. They were yeah. doing a movie. And after my dad passed away, um, a few years later, my mom, he cast my mom again 
um, in Liberty Heights. Ah. To play. To play the. Adrian, grandma. Yeah, grandma. grandma. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's another great Barry Levinson movie. Yeah, a yeah. lesser known Barry Levinson movie. I feel yeah, like Liberty really Heights cool. does not get its its fair share of the Barry Levinson fan love, and it yeah, should. Yeah, yeah, it was a, Everyone's it's fantastic in that yeah, movie. It's very cool. Um, well, speaking of your parents, mm. your this is guest. Is this two thirty seven? Yes. You are our two hundred and thirty seventh guest. Wow. Uh, approximately, and uh, the y you take the cake in terms of the most interesting backstory, family wise. Really? It real. I'm not kidding. Other other people haven't been telling you the truth. I though. guess not. I, I I am truly fascinated by by your your parents' history and mm. and how you came to be born and and how you learned languages. I I don't want to spoil it. I I would love to hear you talk about it. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty cool story. Uh, I'll tell you a very funny story about my my parents are are Holocaust survivors, and um, my they were in hiding for about two and a half years. Yeah. And in 1987, after almost 40 some odd years, after I took them back to Poland to have mm -hmm. a reunion with the Polish farmers that had hidden them for two and a half years. Yeah. And I shot that documentary. I produced it for CBC. Yeah, So Many Miracles. Yeah, it's called mm -hmm. So Many Miracles. At the same time, a book came out um, called So Many Miracles, which was uh, interviews about um, you know, my parents, I had interviewed them for almost 10 years, and it was a really funny story. Actually, I, my daughter, uh, who's now 24, Hannah, about a year ago said, you know, you should put this book out again. It's out of print. And, uh, but I think it needs some editing. And she was really <laughs> cool. So she re-edited the book, and I'm, um, we're hoping it's going to come out in the next uh, year or so, oh, a, a new version of the, of the book. But there's a very funny story about how this book came about, since we got all the time We in have the world. plenty of time, Saul. Don't hold anything back. I said I wasn't going to talk about my first wife, but I lied. So <laughs> I, was, I, was, um, I, I was in my 20s, and I was living with a, a, an actress. I was just started. I was my first love affair, and we were living together. And she, you know, I hadn't told my parents. She was Irish Catholic. We're not oh. religious. She was from an Irish Catholic family. And I don't, my parents were religious, you know. My father had been an actor. Mm -hmm. My father wasn't allowed in his... In, in my mother's home because he was an actor. You know, he had cut his <laughs> pay us off to do Yiddish theater. So why would I think there'd be anything wrong? But something told me hmm. maybe I shouldn't. Anyway, I not only did I not tell my parents, you know, and I was in my late 20s already, that I'm in love for the first time, that I'm living with them, somebody that I'm in love with. Not only did I, and, and they were in Ottawa. I was a stage actor in Toronto, so this is 300 miles away. And we talked every, I'm an only child. So we talked every week, you mm -hmm. know about why my career wasn't going the way it should be going. <laughs> sure. All kinds of things we would talk about. First right. time I was on television, you know, it was, you know, that's the, the, I called my parents. They were really with me. Of course. My mother said, um, I said, you see me? I was on television. I mean, it was a big deal. I was on CBC. Yes. Mom? Yes. <laughs> what, you, I wasn't good? Talk to your father about this. Ooh. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? You should have a conversation with your father. Dad, listen to me. I'm listening. Always three quarters, never profile. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, listen, we saved a little money. Yeah? So, yeah, Paul Anker did it, and he's from Ottawa. I said, did a nose job, Paul? <laughs> Anker? You saved a little money. That's all you have to say to me? <laughs> So I was on the phone all the time with my parents, and we were very close. But I never mentioned to them, not only that I was living with somebody, but even yeah. her name. Yeah. Kate, Saul, you, you know, when am I going to see your parents? Oh, you know, that'll happen. It'll happen soon, probably. When they come into Toronto to see me in a play, uh, you know. Yeah. You told them a, 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 a about us, though. <laughs> Kate, you didn't say a word about me, did you? Because something, I, you know, I don't, what, 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 why? Isn't this a serious thing for you? Of course it's here. Well, if it's huh? serious, then why aren't you telling, I, you've met my parents. Yep. Yeah, you know, um, I'm, go, I, I, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, is it because I'm not Jewish? I said, you know, that's kind of silly. Maybe that's why I didn't bring it up, but I can't understand why, now that you mention it to me, I guess I should have, but I didn't, and I'm nervous about it, and I, I shouldn't be. 
You shouldn't be. No, I, I shouldn't. I'm going to go visit them anyway. And oh God! So I went to Ottawa. Uh huh. And I sat down with my dad, and I because he was going to be the one I had to get through. Mm -hmm. And I he he loved to talk and he loved to philosophize, and I figured that I might be able to manipulate him into a kind of a liberal corner. Nice. It wasn't going to be hard because sure. he loved to talk about things like, you know. Alexander the Great, you know that he made an edict that all the governors of the conquered territories, they had to marry, they had to marry the conquered, a woman from the conquered territory. They had to intermarry. I said, huh. no, I, I, I didn't know that, Dad, and I'm egging him on here, because it would stop revolution. You understand? The children, once they had children, then revolution would be very difficult for them. They intermarry into the Greeks. Oh, oh I said, it's very easy. You know the reason that they are Jews today? So? Anti-Semitism. <laughs> if not for anti-Semitism, there would be no Jews. I said, what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, they push you in a corner. They push you in a corner uh, for generations. They, get, they make laws. They push you in a ghetto. Of course, you're going to be Jewish. But if there was tolerance for, tolerance for centuries, what do you think would happen? You think it would be a big deal to marry the neighbor's daughter? No. <laughs> and after a few generations, who would be Jews? A few fanatics with black hats. That's, <laughs> that's what would happen. And I, and, I, and I was going in the right area, right? Yeah. So I said, um, that's really interesting. You know, uh, Dad, funny, you should, you should talk about that. Perfect intro. I am, I am actually, I've fallen in, in love. Well, I fall in love with with a, um, a, a a woman, Canadian woman, um, Jewish. Hmm. <laughs> she's she's uh, interestingly from a very maligned, you know, very difficult. Um, they're all Irish, you know, the troubles and the persecution oh, those people have gone worst. through. You you're living with a shiksa. Now my father, who was during this whole conversation with smoke. It was a smoker. He was smoking matinee. I'll never forget. It was a yellow pack called matinees. They were Canadian brand. Mm -hmm. There was an ashtray on the table. And you've got to remember, my father was not religious. And after he said, you're living with a shiksa, he... stubbed out a cigarette. And he took the ashtray. And he poured the ashtray. <laughs> Head. So ashes on his head, and he took his 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 shirt and he ripped it. So rending of the garments, ashes on the head, biblical reaction. Uh, then he got up and he went in the corner, right? Uh huh. And he started saying, "Kaddish, the prayer for the dead." I said, "Oh my God, who who is that for?" He said, "For myself." <laughs> my mother came in the room. What happened? In Yiddish, my father goes, I left with the shiksa. Living with the shiksa. I left. I left. I, in oh. shock. Get, got home. Oh, my God. Kate said, and of course, you've got to remember that I'm part of a theater community. Yeah. We overshared everything. Everybody yeah. knew I was going home to talk to my Holocaust surviving parents to tell them I was living with Kate. Yep. Everybody knew that. Yep. Kate says, hey, how'd it go? I said, great. Went great. Really? Oh, yeah, not a problem. <laughs> really? See, I told you not to worry. Oh, you have, you have no idea. Not. <laughs> and, and she said, so, so you were worried over nothing? She said, absolutely. I was just in shock and I was embarrassed. Right? What are you going to tell her? A lie. Yeah. So I, and everybody, I told everybody the same lie. Yeah. So we're going to meet soon. Now I'm just going to delay now. Now what am I going to do? What the hell was I going to do? I haven't got a brother or sister to talk to. Right. I have no idea. I had no idea there would be this biblical reaction. I mean, really, I, would ca I called home a couple of weeks later. Yeah. You got to remember, I, this was a regular thing. I called home. We talked about stuff. Of course. I'm an only child. I called home. If my mother answered the phone. I go, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right away. Still crying. Has not stopped. Can I talk to my, his dad? He doesn't want to talk to you. All right, all right. So there was no, nothing to be done. I didn't know what to do. Then about, I don't know, a couple months later, I had a revelation. Just a little bit of a manipulative revelation. My parents were being capable, biologically incapable, 
of, of, of turning me down about anything that had to do with my career. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, they just wanted me to be successful, and it's just the way it is with immigrants and, and any immigrant family, with yeah. parents in general, but certainly immigrant families. So, Mom, at one point I saw, it was a couple months later, she got through the tears, I waited her out. Oh. Listen, Mom, um, somebody is interested, I've got publishers interested in me writing a book about your experiences during the war, before, during, and after the war. This was not true. There was nobody <laughs> interested so, at all. So much and deception. So she said, well, you mean, but they, the, the book, the movie, Diary of Anne Frank is out. Everybody knows about it. No, no, I, I know that, Mom. But you know, I'm becoming a successful actor in Toronto. And people, they're very happy for you. You know, I, I, I know. Thank you, Mom. You shouldn't. Yeah, OK. Or, I, I'm, I know you're happy for me. But this is, that's why maybe, you know, people are interested now that I'm becoming a little bit better known about your story. And they need me to interview you. So this was my thing. I could go back. From, really? So who, who, who's the publisher? First thing that popped into my head was Penguin. Penguin, Penguin books. Wow. And she said, that's a big company. I yeah. said, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Well, I'll talk to your father. You should come and you're going to interview. I said, yeah. So this was what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. But in the back of my mind, I knew my father would not be able to stay out of it. He was such a performer. Uh -huh. There was no way that he could stay out of it. And I had arranged, I wasn't going to stay home, I was going to stay in a hotel, I was going to go. Now, of course, I told Kate and my friends the same lie. <laughs> that there was a publisher. Now, of right. course, I didn't tell them that there was a publisher, because they would have figured that out quickly. Sure. Too they, many connections. They could have called They Penguin. could have called, or they would have known, Penguin, yeah. who's the editor? Yeah. I just said, no, 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 I'm writing a book about my okay. parents. I'm going to look for a publisher. Okay. And that was fine. Nothing, they, they couldn't disprove that. No. So... I uh, went to Ottawa. My father didn't even come to the door. He was in another room. He didn't say hello. My mother was, you know, sitting there, and I had a tape recorder. It was 1979 or 8, and set 19, or like that. Yeah. No, no, you didn't have a video camera yet. Yeah. You know? So there was this cassette recorder on the table. Thank God there was tape in it. And, uh, and I started asking her questions. Now, you got to remember, Sammy, I, 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 I had heard these stories all my life. Sure. They weren't any, they were going in one ear and not the other. So it wasn't that I was that interested in their stories, which I had heard a million times, mm -hmm. or interested in sharing them, because I wasn't going to. There was no book. This was just my way back <laughs> to my parents. And maybe in the back of my mind, maybe if there was anything of, of any profundity going on, uh -huh. I was thinking maybe I can find out the root of this horrible biblical reaction to living with a non-Jewish girl, because they weren't religious Jews, you got to remember. We one sure. thing if they were Hasidic Jews or even Orthodox. Yeah. So that's not who they were. Yeah. So it was, why? Why? The Holocaust, you know, I presume, is what Kate had thought originally, that maybe I was nervous about that. And I said, no, why? They would, they would, that only taught them that intolerance is a horrible thing. And how wrong was I? <laughs> so didn't take long. It was in the same day. Mm -hmm. Within an hour, you could hear my father listening. He was in the other room. She doesn't know what she's talking about. First of all, it was Samuel Brasminto. His name was Kostainsky, not Kozlowski. You know? <laughs> and uh, and, and, uh, and oh. pretty soon, he would come in. What do you want to know? So we had this formal relationship. And I said to my mom at the end of the day, I'm going to a hotel. She said, what is ridiculous? You're sleeping in your room. I said, never mind him. You sleep in the room. We won't talk about that. So we kept that subject apart. Okay. We had a formal relationship. I'd come home. This was going on maybe once every five weeks or six weeks. I would go back. I would do a full four or five hour session. Ooh. And I did this. And, and all my friends thought this was what was going on. Now, to make a, a very long story much shorter, the book eventually got published by Penguin. <laughs> <laughs> Did you submit to them yeah, and say, I, eventually, here's, and here's say what, hey, I've it, been lying here, about this. Well, here's what actually happened, and this is something that may be interesting to actors, is the horror of this. I don't know why it didn't occur to me within a year. And I'm amazed that it, only, it took as long as a year, Yeah, Kate said, 
the following thing, which you could imagine. I hadn't anticipated, but it was horrific. Hey, can I read some? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Before computers. Right. Before I had any money. Right. Tape recorder, typewriter. Yeah. Middle of the night. Yeah. You've got to go back. <laughs> What'd they say? Mm. Okay, I'm writing. Oh my God. One, I'm writing shit down so that the lie can continue. Of course, other people wanted to read it. Now I'm writing shit just to keep the lie going. Am I interested in this stuff? No, I've heard it all. In the middle of the night, this, this was the epiphany. In the middle of the night, I don't know, fucking three or four in the morning, I'm typing shit out. And suddenly the words on the page, because I'm an actor, because it's their monologue, it's their dialogue. Uh -huh. Sometimes they're talking and arguing with each other. And I had to clean it up because it was repetitions and redundancies and, and stuff that uh, grammatically was great, but I was catching their voices because mm -hmm. I'm uh, an actor. <laughs> so uh, there was the, their voices were emerging on the page. Mm. But in order for their voices to emerge on the page, I had to do some writing, right? I had to sure. rewrite a little just to get their, vo their voices, even though they both have this accent, they're different. Right. They have different rhythms. Of course. Well, I was caught. Suddenly, I was into it. Yep. And suddenly, the, the, the language had music. The stories had depth, resonance, and there were questions that occurred to me that had never occurred to me uh, growing up. Yeah. So now when I went back, I was actually writing the book. Oh, Once man. I started writing the book, it took a little while, and eventually, I mean, the irony is that Kate and I broke up just, just as the book came out, you know? <laughs> and of course, they got to meet Kate and all of that. Uh -huh. We got through all that, you know. Wow. We got through all that. Uh, but, uh, and uh, once I realized I wasn't just writing a family memoir, when other of my theater community uh, read it and said, no, you've actually got something here that's, that's deeper than just a family memoir. There's, yeah. The stories are interesting. Their lives and their love affair is interesting. And their relationship for two and a half years with a farmer, his wife, and her child, not his, that your father, in a way, raised, wow. and there, and and how they were hidden, the the death of your sister, I had a sister who died in the day she was born, um, all all of that was really interesting, and it had humor because of my parents' personality. That's when I submitted it to uh, uh, somebody at Penguin, an editor who who fell in love with it, and it got published and. And that was how that happened. That, a long answer to it. No, story. that's and that's only so, and that that's an incredible story. It, and so, with the introduction to my book, is this story now? Yeah, I tell the truth about it. Oh my God! I mean, now I do. Sure. You know, my, uh, I don't want. I didn't want to embarrass my parents. In the first edition, I was in a truncated version of this. Yeah. But <laughs> but, uh, but now they're gone, and I and I I tell the the story. And ironically, what happened. Um, Sorry to keep on about this. No, but please. I'm not it's talking about my acting career. No, we'll, at all, we'll get to that. In, we'll this get is to interesting it. because um, what I didn't know uh, when I wrote the book was that I was going to meet Eleanor, who, um, whom I've been married now 25 years, and I was going to have children. And Sam is 20 and Hannah's 24. Yeah. And one of the, and she, uh, Eleanor's from a whole Scottish background, hmm. interesting background. But one of the things that came up as a dad, which I never considered was when do you introduce your children, Jewish children, or half Jewish children or whatever, to this subject, genocide, yeah. how? And as far as I knew, having gone around the country, both in Canada and the you know, United States, um, with the documentary and my book, and meeting a lot of different kinds of uh, Holocaust survivors and children of Holocaust survivors, that Jewish children certainly are given this information at an age way before they can handle it or understand it. Absolutely. I knew, for example, that when I was on the playground at the age of six, I, do, you, do you have any grandparents? Yeah. Mine were murdered. Because <laughs> so it's a badge, you know, what do I know about right. it? Right? So it was a, a thing that Jewish kids are, how, how do you deal with it? So we, my kids went to a Steiner school, which is a Waldorf school system. It's very interesting developmentally. We talked to the teachers at a young age, said, what, what do you think? And they said, you know, when they're around the age of 12 or 13,
when when they're starting to put things together historically and mm. they're able to put things in context and they're they're at that stage of development if you can hold it back till then because they're yeah. going to get movies tv and all kinds of stuff but if you can hold it back we managed to keep them younger longer hmm. and really until they were 13 till hannah was 13 first and we we were introducing this subject to to her by being able to give her the book and then show her the documentary. My parents were still alive. No, my parents were gone by that time. They were gone. And, uh, and they, and, but at least they could, that was a way of introducing it. But something came up that we hadn't anticipated, hmm. which is also something I just wrote about. Do tell. Well, we had to clear this with the parents of the class, right? Sure. So you have to clear this with the parents of the class, which the teacher of the class thought that wasn't going to be a problem. We showed them the documentary. And we didn't want to do, uh, actually, we weren't interested, or I wasn't interested in doing a, uh, I was going to, in other words, not only, I, I've skipped a, a beat here. No, no. Not only was I going to introduce this to my daughter, the school wanted me to show the film to, to the, the class. class. But I didn't want to do it as um, Holocaust education. I, I said, let's have a week where we use this documentary as a way to inspire the kids to explore their own personal family history. Ah. Right? Sure. So they can look at this. I can say, they can see this very dramatic documentary and who thinks that my background's more exciting than theirs. And all these kids' hands will go up and I'll say that's only because you haven't asked the right questions because the truth is that in the last two generations there's war, great love affairs, miracles, oh, extraordinary yeah. Tolstoyan things that have happened in your background. You just have to ask the right person the right question. Sure. So that's what we were going to use it for. And, and we were going to get the parents to agree. Well. One mom who worked at the school, really, who's still our, our, our close friend and a great woman, who was, who, was from, who was from Texas, and her husband also. We were uh, going camping with the kids, and late one night, we were up. Uh, her husband had, hadn't come with us. He was working or something. It was just me and Eleanor and, and this woman. And uh, we were talking about our backgrounds, and I said, you're from, we talked about my parents, and all of that, and we said in a few years, because the kids, were, Hannah was only eight, so it was going to be five years away or four years away mm -hmm. before we were going to even introduce this subject. And we were talked about it, we talked about that, and she said, that's interesting, you know, my background's very interesting too, and, you know, I actually was born in Germany, she said. And I said, oh. She said, no, I was raised by my grandfather until I was 10, because my mother married an American soldier, she was German, and they went to Texas, and I was raised by my grandfather. He was in the German army. I said, and I'd met other people who were children of people who'd been in the German army. It was no big deal. Mm -hmm. Until she mentioned that her, sh that his hat had a skull and crossbones on it. And I said, well, you know, that wasn't just the German army. If it had a skull and crossbones on it, he was in the SS. Ooh. And she said, well, you know, I'm not sure what he was in, really. And the subject room went, I said, you know, I said to Eleanor, in five years, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> because she's in denial about this background. Yeah. Well, eventually, when I went to her, and I said, you know, we're, we're either not going to show this, I'm not going to show this to your daughter in the same class, this documentary, because uh, we're trying to inspire family, if you're closed off about what happened. And she said, I, I've never really looked him up, but I've had people on the Internet coming after me looking for memorabilia about him. Ooh. And she said, would you look him up? I said, you've never Googled his name? And she said, no. And she said, you want me to do it? Oh, my God. And right now. Uh -uh. She said, yeah. And I said, okay. And I did. And she said, I said, well, there's good news and there's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> and That's the understatement of the century. What's the good news? The good news is that he's not a wanted war criminal. And the bad news is that he should have been. Not only that, but the irony was he was part of a unit that was operating in the area that my parents operated. But anyway, she, she opened all the doors and windows. She began to understand this woman, this mom. Yeah. She was very brave, incredibly brave, and she, all kinds of things, why her mother fought with her grandfather, what, all, what the, why the uncle was a recluse. There were a lot of things that started to make sense to her. Yeah. And she talked to her daughter, and at the end result was that both my daughter and her friend watched that the, the granddaughter of a victim and the great-granddaughter of a perpetrator watched this together and were brave enough to 
stay together and they're still friends today. Oh. So I wanted to write about that in the book as well. Absolutely. You know? That's that's as incredible a story as the other as one. any part of it. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, if uh, if you're just tuning in, uh, this, this is, is Holocaust the, Education the Jewish Week. Guilt Power Hour. <laughs> uh, my guest is Saul Rubinek. We're not going to be discussing any of his acting, writing, and directing. <laughs> We're just going to be talking all things Jew. <laughs> Did you have a nice bagel with a schmear this morning, Saul? Come on. So. Um, wow. Well, thank you. I, I mean, th there's a lot you can read about about you and your parents and how they were Holocaust survivors and how you were born in a refugee camp mm. in, in in Germany mm. and uh, and that's that's incredible. But those stories that you just shared, I've not heard those. I don't think no, I don't yeah, think those are available I, anywhere else. No, so no, no. I'm I'm truly honored that you would share that with yeah, yeah, with me and with us. And uh, here's a. Uh, Here's a, a nice change of pace. So, hey, Saul, according to IMDb, and I think this is wrong, you played a punk in the original Death Wish? No. Nope, didn't think so. I, I knew was IMDb no, was no, wrong. No, no, no. Oh, no, but I know where, what you were in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were in Death Wish 5. Of course I was. Who, Damn wh right. who wasn't? The face of death. <laughs> yes, well. Um, when I told uh, my brother, Max, who is an even bigger movie fanatic than I am, that you were coming on the show today, of your entire body of work, he likes death which wish. he is familiar with virtually all of, he says, oh, oh, you got to ask him about Death Wish 5. Oh that was one of Charles Bronson's last roles. Yeah. And he got to work with him, and I'm dying to know what that experience was like. He was um, pretty standoffish, uh, but I, I don't like um, uh, to let that get in my way. <laughs> <laughs> You and me both. I mean, I wanted to hear all about, you know, being in the tunnels and the great yeah. escape. And, yeah. And I wanted to hear about, you know, working with uh, Sir Giuliani. I wanted, I wanted to know all about that. He was very, very gracious to me. And oh, really, that's really nice. kind and turned out to be a really, really cool guy. I mean, I barely remember <laughs> doing that, doing that. Uh, yeah, that was what, 94? So you probably you know, shot it. No, I don't it in, remember. I think it came out in 94, so you probably shot it in 92, 93. Yeah, I'm is guessing. that right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh man, well that's, uh, there you go Max, I hope that answers all your questions. <laughs> Charlie Bronson was a nice guy who uh, he chatted with about lots of great stuff. Um, all right, let's see, I have so much I want to talk to you about, and here we'll keep it with the Jew thing, just, just <laughs> on one okay. more note, on one right. more note, yeah. only because I've looked at a lot of IMDB resumes, and uh, yours has to be the only one, lengthy as it is. You have portrayed not one, not two, but three rabbis. No, not saw. three. What's the third one? Uh, knucklehead. Oh, I forgot about Knucklehead. He doesn't even know. <laughs> I completely forgot about Knucklehead. <laughs> it's a wrestling film, right? Yep. Oh my God, that's the yep. third rabbi. That is the third rabbi. That's very funny. That's three rabbis. Yeah, I know. I, that is that is two funny. two Hasids. Two Hasids. Well, the fun fun one, uh, the real the real fun one was uh, the outside chance of Maximilian Glick, where I played a stand up. Right. I mean, uh, he's a guy who's a Hasidic rabbi who comes to this little town in Canada, um, outside in Manitoba, outside of Winnipeg, Beausejour, as I recall, and he's from Chicago, and he's and they and they're expecting a rabbi, you know, in a suit. Yeah. The normal rabbi. Yeah. The kind that looks like any like a minister. Sure. They don't. And uh, this guy with a beard and payas and a black, they hired a Hasidic rabbi by accident, only. And so they're all mortified because they don't want to look any different from the rest of the community. It's a fun movie, and uh, with a very young Faruza Bach, and Ooh. she's twelve years old, and um, and she and and they're they're shocked by my appearance. But the the character is fun because he's very funny, and he really eventually shaves and becomes a stand-up, which is his life's dream. Wow, is to be stand. That's what his sermons are. He basically is all about tolerance and. And but his sermons are all about it. they're all they're all stand up. He it sounds like a, a regular Krusty the Clown. The other one was yes he was. The other one was um, <laughs> the other one was uh, far more serious, and it was um, uh, the quarrel. It right, the quarrel. Yeah. Yeah. The the or, is, or, or is that based on a show? Yeah, well, I like to call it my dinner with Herschel. <laughs> it was, uh, it's uh, that's the show. It was based. No, it's based on on. Um, on a short story okay. called My Quarrel with Herschel Resigner. And it, it really, it's fascinating. Um, my father knew the author. It's written, a guy called Chaim Grada who wrote the original short story in Yiddish, which I'm still fluent in and can read. 
right was my first language. And I, I, it's a beautiful story. It's, um, you know, it was adapted here and, uh, by a guy called David Brandis really well, and really it was an interesting film. The actual story is um, two young men mm -hmm. are in yeshiva before the war, uh, before the Holocaust, in Poland. And one of them is the, the guy who runs the yeshiva is his dad and very religious, you know, very, very orthodox. The other one, his best friend, the other guy, uh, one is reading forbidden books, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Chekhov, mm. whatever he's reading, and eventually has to leaves the yeshiva. He's the smarter one. And his father's always saying, why can't you be as smart as him? But he's the one who leaves. They don't see each other. They both get married, they have children, everybody is killed. That they've hardly, they don't even know if the other one's alive. Wow. Now you're in Montreal, although I think in the original story it's not in Montreal, it may be Paris, or I'm not sure what city. Okay. Some western city. Okay. And the religious one, the one whose dad was running the yeshiva, is now full beard, Hasidic. And it's uh, the time of uh, Rosh Hashanah, and they're doing tashlik, which is basically throwing crumbs into a move, flowing water as a way of expressing regret uh, over, the, over the year. Uh, uh, um, an orthodox ritual. And th he sees mm -hmm. his friend who's secular. He's only there to do a poetry reading. And he's in the park. We did this in Montreal. He's in the park actually to return some jewelry because he got laid the night before at a reading and he works, you know. And the two friends didn't even know that each other, they didn't know they were alive. Yeah. And, and uh, it's just their quarrel starts again, which is oh. about God and about, you know, the, the basic struggle of, of postmodern, postmodern, post-Holocaust Jewry, which is about, you know, how could God have allowed this to happen and how can you, in one, one who believes the only way to, to survive and to em is to embrace the world, and right. the other one who believes you have to shut yourself away from the sinful oh. world. And it's a very interesting piece. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah, really cool. I, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to say it's not available on any streaming mediums, but I do believe the DVD is available. The DVD is available. It's not streaming anywhere, huh? Not to my knowledge. Well, now it is. Now it is. Well, in fact, we're going to act it out. I have some <laughs> scripts right here. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, it's really cool. That's great. Three rabbis, right? Yeah, the three rabbis. Yeah. I've only played one rabbinical student, so. No, you got time. I'm, I'm, young I'm yet. still working on it. I'm still working on it. Well, I do got the beard going now, so you hopefully, do. hopefully that'll pay off for me. That's all I really wanted to do. Since I couldn't actually be a rabbi to make my mother happy, at least I can play one on TV. Really, she would have been happy. No, she would not have been happy at all. See, that. he's a liar. No. Just... Well. <laughs> no. um, all right, let's talk about a little movie called Unforgiven. Mm. Uh, I believe it won uh, Best Picture. Yeah. Uh, directed by the brilliant but slightly crazy Clint Eastwood. Um, and you played W.W. Bo Beauchamp? Beauchamp. Beauchamp. Yeah. Beauchamp. 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 Yeah, I, I guess they it's call a French Beauchamp, name. Yeah. Um, and boy, what a great movie. Oh, yeah. Boy, what a great role. What a great everything about that movie. Um, I would love to hear some of your experience from that. I was shooting a movie called man trouble with uh, Jack Nicholson when I heard that they were auditioning for a new Western mm. and that there was this role. And Jack said, overheard, said, I hear that you're putting yourself on tape for my buddy, Clint. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, yeah, how did, yeah, he, he has a rumor, I guess, that I was doing, I'm going to put myself on tape. It was, okay. I had a, not a lot of people were doing that. It was 1992, I guess, something like that, 91, yep. 92. And um, he said, just uh, take my advice and do more than is what required. And I said, when's the last time you ever auditioned for, I mean, for anything? I'm just putting, <laughs> he's sitting there with cold slices of cucumber on his eyes in the makeup chair. If you want my advice uh. about how to audition for Clint, when's the last time you auditioned for 19... 59, you yeah. know, was your last time. You could teach me about being a movie star, but I'm, well, you think I'm an asshole. No, no, no. I, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm just putting you down. I, he gave, gave me some advice, and I, and I actually did uh, my own. I did way more than was required. And I so got the cast. advice was do way more than was required. Yeah, do more. Because I'm also, I would love the benefit of Jack's advice. Well, for mind. Clint, anyway. And when I got the role, 
um, quite quickly. And eventually, he said, "Well, it was your, just your tape stood out. For one thing, you didn't go. I didn't. I refused to go into a studio with a casting director. I just, if the director wasn't there as an actor, in those days, and even today, uh, if you're, if I'm going to be put on tape, uh, and the director isn't there, or the producer is the casting director. I'll say I'll send it in, or I'll give you a link. I'll do my own. Yeah. It, it, usually, it's much better, and you have your, you have all the time in the world to do it, rather than sure. the 15 minutes where you feel rushed and the lighting is horrible and." You, you're with the casting director. It's better to, but if the director's there, of course you want to go. Oh yeah. But not if they're not there. Why? Why not send it anyway? He wasn't going to be there. Hmm. So when I got the role and I came into L.A. for costume fitting or whatever, I remember meeting him for the first time. I said, "Let me ask you something." I said, "You don't audition people in person." Yeah, he only. Casts and I said, he said, "No, no." I, I, I said, "Why is that?" He said, "Well, because I." Uh, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to say no to people. <laughs> I'm an actor who's been through all that shit and it'd be horrible. I, he really it was because he didn't, he didn't want to, he couldn't say no. He yeah. needed to have, he needed not to be in the room. It was a very interesting uh, experience and unique experience. I don't know, it's been, you know, 20 some years now since, since yeah. that film, whether he's the same director that he was, but I would imagine he isn't changed a lot. Yeah. I can tell you this, that uh, and some of this story is just just for actors, I guess. But but doesn't matter. We have a lot of fans. But it's, who but it's really like interesting. He's a very stuff. interesting man. Yeah. And I'll tell you a couple of unforgiven stories. Please. He, if he wasn't famous, in other words, if he wasn't a famous face, right? And as used to you as you are being on a movie set, if you came on that set, it would probably take you about twenty minutes to half an hour to figure out who the director was. <laughs> you wouldn't know who the director was. You wouldn't, there's got to be somebody leading this. Which one is, who, where is he? Because he was Clint and he looked like Clint, you knew it was Clint, but if he, yeah. if he wasn't, you wouldn't have figured it out. And the reason was, um, uh, my theory eventually was that many of the directors that I worked with uh, might as well have worn, be wearing a T-shirt that says "My Vision," <laughs> and on the back of the T-shirt uh -huh. it says "Shall Be Realized," <laughs> right? Okay. Or bust. With Clint, I have to say he would be wearing a T-shirt if that would have said "My Vision," and on the back it would have said "Hopefully Will Be Transcended." <laughs> <laughs> because in order to transcend what it is you have in your head, in order to be better, you have to risk what's in your head. Mm. You have to risk it all. Uh -huh. If you're going to collaborate yep. in, uh, with other people and get their input and not lead them down a, a certain path yeah. in order to manipulate them into what you had originally conceived and pretend that that's organic, which sure. is the <laughs> methodology of a lot of directors. Sure. If you're really honestly going to collaborate with people, then you have to risk your vision. Mm. His vision was simple. He chose the script. Mm -hmm. David Peoples wrote Unforgiven as, I think it was, I remember what it was called originally, William Money Killings or something like that, or Whore's Gold or one of those titles in 1977. As, oh. And it never got made and it was bought by Francis Ford Coppola to be a zoetrope, Western. And then it went into Turnaround and Clint read it 10 years before we shot it as a writing sample that David Peoples' agent sent in. And he said, writing sample? <laughs> what about this? And he got it, he bought it from, um, from Zotro yeah. and waited 10 years till he felt old enough. He was only 52 and he, wa he waited till he was 62 to play the role. And what's interesting uh, uh, about the fact that he was so collaborative and so interesting a director was, as you know, scripts are rainbow colored by the time you're finished because sure. every time you do a revision there's either a pink page or a yellow or a blue yeah, or whatever salmon. Yeah. yeah all these different pages and so when, by the time you're done shooting you've got a script that's literally like a rainbow yes our script because there were five or six pages changed by coppola it was in 1982 or 81 sure. it was dated 1982 it was all white pages and when we finished shooting, the script was all white pages. Uh. I, about a year or so later, David Peoples wasn't on the set. I'd never met him. Mm. A year or so later, I was doing a movie. It was Macaulay Culkin's last movie as a child actor called Getting Even with Dad, with Ted Danson. 
and I, I had heard, and I wasn't sure that David people lived in San Francisco or Berkeley or somewhere around there, and I wanted to meet him. And uh, I got a hold of his agent, and, and, and I got the word back, absolutely, here's his number, call him. And I went out to his house wow. in Berkeley. Um, he wanted to meet W.W. person, too, and it was really cool for me. <laughs> and he told me a really interesting story, <clears throat> which I hope is true. <clears throat> but it was fascinating. I said, so you didn't know He's about what they were going to do to the script. He said, you know, I'm a writer, which means essentially that um, I sell my children off. That's what I do. Of course. I don't know how they're going to get raised or what they're, going to, what they're going to turn into. I sell them off. Sometimes you keep one child back. You don't want to sell, you know, but eventually that's my life is... Uh, is basically turning my stuff into other things. I, yeah. I rewrite stuff. I make a living as a writer, which is usually making it worse. And that's uh, 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 that's my life. When this got sold, I had no idea it was going to happen. I got a call saying, "Do you want to? There's a screening. Come to Mal Paso on the Warner Brothers lot. We'll do a screening." And I, he said he had expected that there'd be a screening with a lot of people. Right. When he went into the screening room, it was before the release. Okay. It was just him and Clint. Oh. And I said, what happened? He said, I, I, there was no one there. It was for me. And you've got to remember that now this is 1992. I hadn't, I mean, I sold the script in, in the 70s, the late 70s. Oh, man. To Coppola. And I maybe had done five or six pages of revisions. And I had no idea. And, uh, and then what happened? He said, well, I, you know, I wept. It was one of those experiences I never expect to have again, certainly I'd never had, which is I saw what I wrote uh, on the screen without anything changed. Oh. And it was, uh, and, and, I, uh, and only Clint probably could have gotten away with it or done it yeah. because of his relationship with Bob Daly and Terry Semmel, who were running Warner Brothers at the time yeah. and were so um, um, you know, who were so respectful to the material and to Clint. Right. And, and Clint, who said, I'm not, there's nothing broken here, I'm not changing it. Yeah. He, he had this attitude. Can you imagine as an actor, first day of shooting, I, <clears throat> I said to him, um, can I talk to you about something in the, in the script? And he said, absolutely. And I said, you know, Clint, uh, there's no dialogue for my character up until, I'm not asking for any, <laughs> but, but there's no dialogue up until, uh, for the whole first part, it's right. just, Basically, Richard Harris is uh, English Bob talking, and I'm listening. Yeah. He said, yeah. And my character is described by the writer as very nervous, a very nervous sort. And, I, and he said, yeah. I said, I don't think that's right. He said, you don't. And he, I said, no, I, I, I think um, he's never been to the West. He's been writing about it. I don't think he knows fuck all. And I think he should be cocky have a, until guns are pointed at him and he pees his pants. I don't think... I think his attitude should be, he said, let me just stop you. I said, yeah. He said, you're telling me all this because, because you're the director and I'm, I'm asking whether it's okay with you if I change what was written here. He said, well, you'll get to know me. You're in charge of the department called W.W. Beauchamp, not me. Uh. I don't know what's right. I honestly, you're asking me a question, I don't, you're, I guess a lot of directors would say, no, this is what I think. Yeah. I'll know when you're performing it. If the, I'll be sure to tell you if there's anything that you do that I don't understand, I'll ask. But you really don't need to check with me. Wow. Then I found out that's true of everybody. Yeah. Then I never saw him direct anybody. <laughs> I never saw him, listen, man, I never saw him direct an actor except to say, he might say, Sam, if you, I don't know how, what you're intending here, but if you want to be seen, I'd be a little a step to your right. That's where the light. <laughs> but he might, very, you know, very technical. Okay, so, but at one point, I mean, you know, he, his golfing buddy was uh, Gene Hackman, but he never worked with him. Yeah. And, uh, and we were all, he was very complimentary. We were all like, when, when are we going to get some direction? But not that we were frustrated, because he was very kind and soft spoken. Mm. But you weren't being directed like your motivations and your choices were not being questioned or even he would not even tell you you know that's a great choice let's try something completely different none of that yeah you were in charge of that's, that no, no he never he's... pretended to to do that which means it could come out a lot of different ways right sure okay so 
And the other thing is that directors, most directors, want, the, what's their job? A director's job is to get as many choices as possible in the editing room. Well, he likes to shoot, there's a myth that he only likes two takes. That's not true. Oh, it's not true. No, okay. he likes two good takes. Oh. They don't have to be, if you're shooting a master, he doesn't need all of the master shot in twice. Right. He needs just, he needs to know there's two versions of parts of it. Okay. So he's got an alternate choice. Otherwise, it's masturbation, and he, he didn't do it. Right. He learned from guys that had to be quick. And so, basically, we saw two, two good takes, but not three hmm. good takes. So he isn't going to say, that's an interesting choice. We got that. Let's, let's do this. Yeah. I've got a story about that. Remind me about takes. Okay. okay. About um, Against All Odds. Okay. The exact opposite. Also with a great director. And, but this was, no, we didn't have that. So at one point, we're doing the shootout, which, by the way, he said, uh, oh, there's like uh, so many people in here. He go, because it's a bar. And he's saying, OK, well, until I, I kind of come in with the shotgun, and mayhem is going to start. But before that, the horrors are here, the deputies are here, you're talking about getting a posse together. I'm going to go have a coffee. I'm sure you can work out the blocking. And he left. <laughs> <laughs> So we did. Oh I immediately, God. immediately knowing that there are four days on the schedule yeah. for this, or three or four days for the shootout, yeah. I immediately looked for the nearest chair so I could sit <laughs> for four days. An actor after my them own all heart. fucking stand. I'm sitting yep. the fuck down yep. for four days. So I did. That's what I did. I found a chair, sat down, so this is my block. Good on this you. This is good. And, and then um, until a deputy falls on me. So that's what I was right. doing. So, he came back in when we were ready, and he said, okay, cool. And then we, we, we staged it, and then he set up the camera for the beginning of the shootout. He kills the bartender with one blast of a shotgun. Right. And now Gene Hackman's standing there. Yeah. And I forget exactly the line, but he says something like, you know, uh, after he shoots me, shoot him down. Like right. Dog yeah, after so, he kills me, so, something like, shoot him down. Yeah, you know after you pull the trigger, these yeah, guys are going to blow you down. Shoot him down. Yeah. And uh, Clint pulls the trigger. And nothing, Spoiler alert. And, he, and click, it clicks. Yep. And the next line is Gene Hackman's, the sheriff's line, misfire, misfire. kill the son of a bitch. Yeah. Okay? And at that point, all hell breaks loose. So that was the cut. So we get to that point. He's, got, he's on sticks. His camera's on sticks. It's steady, pointing over the barrel at Gene. Mm. And can shoot him down like the dog he is. Click. Misfire. Kill the son of a bitch. Cut. Gene. Direction is going to happen. It was uh, like a moment <laughs> out of, out of, like, out of uh, what? And of course, you, you, if he was, could you do that standing on your head? He would have gone, absolutely. <laughs> At this point, you know, you would just do a, yeah. whatever he wanted. Whatever. Well, yes, Clint, whatever you need. Ah, I'd like to get my scissors in there. I'll never forget that phrase. I'd like to get my scissors in there. You know what I mean? And Gene said, you want to pause after the click so that you can make an edit. <laughs> he says, yeah, I would. So he wanted a beat after the click. Clint, Clint was right, I mean, Gene was right on the, on Misfire, the money. Yeah. Misfire killed the son but she wanted to get his scissors in there. Okay? How about that? So he says, absolutely, let's do it again. Take two. Click. Misfire. Kill. Oh, shit. Sorry. Fuck. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I got it. I got it. Take three. Click. Misfire. Kill. Hmm. I, 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 then Clint said, you know what? This isn't your problem, actually. Don't worry about it. Uh, can everybody take 10 minutes? Now, I hung around a lot because I was hoping to direct my first film at that time, mm -hmm. and, I, and he knew that I wanted to learn a lot, and he let, he let me stay, and he it was really, really cool. He was a, a, a bit man. of a mentor for me. And I watched, what's he gonna do here? And he put the camera off, took the camera off sticks, and he put a three-foot section of track down. Mm. And so he changed the setup, and then put the camera on the dolly. And then he called everybody back in. And Gene came in, saw what was going on, and said, and Clint said, just do whatever comes naturally. I said, okay, don't worry about my former director. Whatever comes naturally. Yeah. And now, as soon as the he told 
spoke to the dolly guy. Didn't tell anybody anything. Just the dolly grip. Yep. And as soon as he hit the cl trigger, the dolly moved in. And Gene is a film actor, and and he waited till the dolly got to the end of the track, and then he said, "Misfire killed the son of a bitch." Uh, Clint realized that the I'd never seen this before, and I'm sure there are directors who do this. Yeah. Um, good directors who do this, but I had never seen it before. I had never seen a director change the setup to accommodate the instinct of the actor. <laughs> it's always accommodate your instincts, change your instincts to, to accommodate setup. my setup. Yeah. So he knew that there was something, if he wanted a pause, he shouldn't be on sticks. So that was really interesting to wow. me. Wow. As a film director, another what's another story about Unforgiven? We had a complicated dolly shot, and he couldn't bring some of his crew. He, he likes having the same crew with him a lot. I'm but, sure. But in Canada, we were shooting in Alberta, and outside um, in, in uh, Big River, Alberta, which near Calgary, and there are a lot of Canadian crew uh, who hadn't worked with him before, and he had a dolly grip. I don't think who had who had never who was Canadian, good guy, and. Uh, and Clint doesn't use or didn't use video assist at all. Right. Unless I think maybe when there was an action sequence. It wasn't that it didn't exist. Yeah. It wasn't as sophisticated as it is today. Yeah. And as beautiful as it is today because it was still film, for sure. one thing. Yeah. But uh, no, he didn't use it. He stood be beside the camera and said, I'm seeing it in 4D, and never mind 2D. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I can see what's going on. And he didn't use it, and he was there not in some video village, which most directors are. Right, yeah. So there was yeah, time was yeah. faster, right? Sure. He's right there. So complicated dolly shot. Now, normally when a dolly shot is choreographed, mm -hmm. it is not an unusual question for the grip to say to the director or to the cinematographer who will then ask the director, where do you want the dolly to be on this line? Where do you want it to be on this line? Where do you want it to be on this sure. line? And he, I, I was there when the Dolly Grip asked the cinematographer, Jack Green, and Jack said, ask, Jack, ask Clint. Clint said, oh, hmm. Well, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, I would start pianist mode and I would kind of reach a crescendo. I think that's the way it kind of plays. And walked away. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just picturing some scared Canadian young Dahlia. Uh, what, what, did yeah, yeah. what did he say? Yeah. He said to me, what did he say? I said, I, I heard that the scene starts, pianissimo and reaches a crescendo, and then starts softly, and yeah. he said, okay. And so you never heard or saw a Dahlia grip listen to a scene like this Dahlia grip, listening to the scene and moving it with the dialogue. And he would turn to Clint. Clint was not a video assist. Yeah. He said, Clint said, well, were you listening to the dialogue? Were you listening to the actor? He said, yeah, well, I'm sure it's good. Of course, they're actors, so they'll change it next time. So, you know, stay with it. That's a Clint Eastwood story. That, Not unusual. That is cr a crazy story. It's a good story. Does he, was he still doing his nine to five days then? <laughs> I don't remember. You don't remember? I, they were not. No, they weren't. They weren't particularly long. short. Or, okay. Or they were normal, normal working days. All right. He he never liked noise on the set. He didn't like to say action. Yeah. Uh, didn't like the the feeling as an actor himself. When I got I got to act now. Yeah. He would always go, okay, whenever you're ready, let's just start start it start the scene. Ever work with Ken Quapis, TV director? No. Same thing. Same thing. He won't say action. He'll he just say. It just makes everybody I'll say, nervous. I'll say, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Anytime. Whenever. It made, it made people less nervous. I guess. I don't know me. I'm like a, I'm a racehorse in the gate. I need action. Oh, you do? Yeah. I had a situation, talking about the number of takes, one of my first Hollywood movies was a movie called Against All Odds, and I was working with one of my favorite actors, Jeff Bridges, who was kind of like the zen master of film acting. And I was doing a scene. We had shot Jeff's side of the table mm -hmm. the night before. It was a big club and now we're shooting my side of the table behind me were 300 people <laughs> and on a stage was king creole and the coconuts doing a whole oh act, boy okay oh miming boy. it and doing dance numbers so i felt a lot of pressure oh. to get it right <laughs> sure now i'm a canadian actor who's used to working at cbc and where we don't have a lot of takes and i'm used to getting it right and getting it right quick 
And I was pretty sure I nailed it on the first take. In fact, yeah. that's what the take that made me in the movie, for all I know. <laughs> and I, I was pretty sure I nailed it. And Taylor Hackford, who was directing it, said, um, that was great, let's do it again. Okay, you know, so do it again. And he said, excellent, that was really cool. Third take, something technical went wrong. Fourth take, something else went wrong. Fifth take, he said, great, that was good. Um, and by the time we were into the ninth take, I was starting to sweat, and I would start to fuck up. Yeah. And Jeff is sitting there, and now we're into take 15. I was saying, uh, Taylor, anything? He said, no, let's just do it again. Is there anything that I could do? He said, no, I, I, it's fine, just let's do another one. Oh. Now, I'm very conscious of 300 people here in, in a whole, you know, people miming, working their ass off. Yeah. By the time we were into take 18 or oh, 20 or something, Jeff, Jeff says, what's the matter? And I said, I'm, you know, I don't know what he wants. Yeah. I keep asking. He says, listen, listen to me. He says, you're worried about all those people back there, right? He says, don't, don't worry about them right now, really. Your, your concentration is on saving them work, but <laughs> you, you really shouldn't be. Here, here's the thing that's going on. Taylor Hackford is coming off Officer and Gentleman. He may never be in this situation again. He can do whatever the fuck he wants mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. one of the things he wants to do is do a lot of takes. With you, <laughs> you have this giant toy here, Saul. This giant toy. All the focus is on you. It's a multi-million dollar toy. You get to do whatever the fuck you want. Nobody's stopping you except yeah. you. And you're nervous because you feel you have to get it. Well, you got it about a half hour ago. Now you can just fuck around. Now you can, he just wants to see what else is going to happen. Yeah. Why don't you let something else happen? Because now you, you should just be having fun. You shouldn't be worried about anything. You know? That's his problem. And now I started fucking around. We did, I don't remember, we did 28 takes or something. Oh. I, I would have done 50 I, or 100. I didn't care anymore because yeah. he, Jeff had made me calm about the fact that that's all Taylor was looking for. And in fact, later on, some of those, in another scene, some of the stuff that came out, we never would have gotten if Taylor wasn't doing that. So directors work differently from Clint that still get great stuff, but it was... It was a lesson that I had not understood before. Yeah, that's and that's a, a great young, lesson. As a young actor, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of great directors, you yourself have ventured four times now into the director's chair. Yes, yes. Uh, one of my all-time favorite movies, and I know I told you this the first day I met you, is Jerry and Tom. Uh, yeah. Which, was... which you directed and, and I have a little part in, and I would, I would love to hear... A little bit about Jerry it. and Tom. In fact, I just saw Rick Cleveland yesterday, who wrote the one-act play that this is based on. Yeah. Um, there was a one-act play festival in LA in 1994, uh, where a marathon of one-act plays was put on. There were three different evenings. Each evening had five one-acts or something like that, right? Okay. Or four. I remember. Great, great actors. And um, it was being run by Jerry Levine and Risa Brayman. And uh, Risa, who was a friend of mine, asked me to direct, uh, choose a few, look at a few one acts and choose one, and I chose this one. And what it was, was an older hitman and a younger hitman, mm -hmm. uh, and one actor who plays all their victims. So you needed a kind of Peter Sellers, which, I, and I cast, first I cast an old friend of mine, Sam McMurray, to play the older hitman, and uh, an actor called Bruce McVitie played the younger hitman, mm -hmm. and then uh, Sam introduced me to Dan Castellaneta. Mm -hmm. They had done the Tracy Ellman show together, right, and Dan, right who's kind of an everyman yep. and can play anything, yep. played all the victims. Yep. And it was a hit at the festival. It was a really interesting uh, piece uh, of writing. And m my wife, Eleanor, uh, who's a producer, uh, we thought this might make an interesting film. And together with Rick Cleveland, we developed it into a screenplay and tried to sell it. It was very, very difficult. Rick had never written a screenplay before. He was a playwright. It was his first time doing that. And eventually, eventually, uh, this little company called Cinepix, a Canadian company, uh, these guys running it really liked the material and agreed that Joe Mantegna uh, would be great as Tom and we needed a Jerry. And there was a young actor that they liked who was not well known, who had been at Sundance the year before in a movie with John Turturro called Box of Moonlight. Um, but who was really virtually unknown, Sam Rockwell. And uh, I, I loved his work, and I didn't audition him. I just went to New York and met him and saw that he was sane and cast him. And uh, Wow. 
Uh, <laughs> it was unusual for him, too. Yeah, I'll uh, bet. But he was a stage actor, and I could tell by talking to him that he was going to be right for this. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, it was a really interesting uh, screenplay, but one of the things that we wanted to do with it, be, it's on Netflix, I think, so people it is, can see it. It is, it is online. Uh, I think it's on Netflix. Netflix I know yeah. it's on Amazon, but I do know that they show it not infrequently on cable, I think on Showtime. And so it was eventually channel. bought by Showtime. But, yeah. but so the movie I wanted, I had had this experience, and I don't know if you've had, uh, I'm sure a lot of actors have had this experience. You end up in a scene like this, maybe we're sitting closer together, mm -hmm. we, we're doing a dialogue scene, it's great, it's a two shot, and it's working great, because it's, but for whatever, whether it's dramatic or, or funny, or whatever the yeah. thing is about it, it's working great because of the rhythm that's between the two actors. Yes. And then they shoot coverage because they want to shorten the scene or whatever. And then you watch it on TV later or on the big screen. And it's been cut up. Yeah. And it doesn't, sur and for whatever reason, it's rare that it has the energy and the music that it had when it was in a two shot. Yeah. And I had promised myself in a movie like this, certainly Jerry and Tom, that the movie was gonna be a series of two shots. That I was only gonna cut when necessary. Yeah. And I was gonna leave it play because I couldn't compete with you know, laser beams coming down from spacecraft destroying the White House. I couldn't compete. All I could do was have great material with great actors. That's the only way you could compete and leave them alone. Mm. So we designed shots that would allow the actors to play this great dialogue, especially yeah. when you have actors of the caliber of Mantegna and Charlie Durning and Bill Macy and Ted Danson and Maury Chaikin and Peter Riegert and this great group of Stellar actors. Stellar cast. Amazing group of actors. You wanted to leave them alone for the most part as much as you could. I promised Eleanor, who was married to me and also my producing partner, that I would also cover in order, just in case, to have a trap door to sure. be able to get out uh, shortened scenes, and I rarely used it, but I shot it. And uh, so that was a, a revelation. That was a really cool thing. That's great. Is, the other thing that was about the script that was really interesting that, you know, that had to do with us learning about budgets and how important they were and how creative they can be was that the, the story takes place uh, in the present, in a bar. And the last scene, and it, it's, it's half the scene, first half of the scene. The last scene in the movie is the, is the second half of that bar scene. Af after the first half of that bar scene at the beginning of the movie, it goes back 10 years, and then you get to that bar. It takes 10 years to get to that bar as you watch what happens in the transformation of these two characters, yep. especially Jerry. Okay. So we had to figure out a way, rather than cal calendar flipping by or only always writing stuff at the bottom of the screen, how are you going to get from one scene to another? Well, I had a brilliant cinematographer, Paul Sarasi, and I had a great uh, production designer, uh, Dave Hackle, who was also now a director in his own right. And we got together and we figured out there was a way to do this theatrically. He said, well, what I, I really, I had already said I'd really like to figure out a way not to cut between past and present, right. or always to, yeah. to move forward. Moving forward in time. So they, we figured out a very simple way, without any kind of CGI, to do it. So for example, I've got, let's say I had this, oh, you can't see it from there, maybe you no, can. No, cut, yeah, cut to the wide. So, so you can see you know, West Side Comedy Theater, and let's say that that's behind me, so my face is here, yeah. and you're, you're sitting there and we're talking. Yep. Now, the next scene, let's say, is exterior daylight. This could be night here, interior right. night. And the next scene is exterior daylight farm okay. with a cow. <laughs> yes. All right? Yes. And we want to go, it's a year later, but we want to go from the shot of me against this to, to the... Farm, cow, daylight, yeah. All we do is we shoot the scene, including all our coverage, the wide shot, and eventually the last shot is on me. We just simply take this wall with us or a facsimile of this wall, to yeah. the farm. Yeah. And now we've got the last piece of dialogue in this scene, and you, you just pan away from it. Yeah. And even though there's an edge, because there's a farm, right. it doesn't matter. No, it certainly doesn't. And, and the audience accepts it. So we'd have contests in the crew and in the production about how to do the hardest one. Oh. Nobody could figure this out. We could figure them all out. You, when you look at the movie, you'll see, oh, I see what they did. Oh, it's... It but is, there's one yeah. that was really, really hard to do. Can I and guess? Yeah. Was it the blood? No. Oh. No, that was fairly simple. I guess so. It was, it was going, how do you go from interior 
movie theater into exterior crane shot parking lot, uh, used car lot. Oh. It has to be a single shot. Right. Well, somebody in the crew figured it out. So what, what's going on in the scene? I wish we could just show a clip. It's really I fun. Know, it was I'm really sorry. fun, really, really fun. So what happens in the scene is that every year there's a hit and Jerry ends up going on hits as, a, as an apprentice right. and eventually becomes the hitman. But in this particular scene, they're going to somebody who's in witness protection, it's Ted Danson, and he was watching, he's in the balcony of an old CD movie theater, and he's mm -hmm. watching the screen where his, the love of his life, who is a, a stunt performer, uh, who is killed, murdered, and he's watching, he's always gonna be, that's why they know he's gonna be there, and they know they're gonna off him. They were under contract to get him. And he kind of realizes it once they're there, that they're there for that reason. But before they kill him, he talks about this woman on the screen. He says, yeah. this isn't the best part. The best part is when she's down in her basement and she's just cleaning her Uzi. And you can see the little hairs on her arm. And I don't know, my heart just skips a beat and just about stops at that moment. You know, he's talking about the love of his life. Yeah. And Jerry is t taken with him and is shocked when the guy is killed. After the guy is killed, as he's leaving the theater, Tom is already gone. Jerry turns to look at the screen. You can hear the slide of an Uzi. And that scene that Ted Danson was talking about is up there. And there's the woman, and she's cleaning her Uzi. <laughs> and it's a very close shot, and you can see the little hairs. And you go back to Jerry's face. Yeah. But when we cut back to the screen, we didn't cut back to the screen. We were very close on the screen. like So you didn't see the edges of the screen. We were very close on the screen. Cut back to Jerry at the back of the theater. Now, when we cut, you see this woman again cleaning her ears. You can see the hairs on her, but she's actually sitting on a platform above uh. the parking, above the, the car lot. Um, there's a crane <laughs> shooting her with a matching shot with the background the same uh -huh. as it was on the screen. And you can see her cleaning, you see the hairs on her arm, and it just moves off her wow. onto the parking lot of the, of the, of, so the, that was so fun. Good. Now, the problem was, that you're on a low budget film. Right. We had 30 days to shoot it, which was a significant amount of time, but we had 12 transitions like this, 12. Each of them, no, we had, yes, we had 12, 12, yeah. Uh, six. We had, we had whatever we, whatever we had, I don't remember, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I had them up. Yeah. I knew that we could only do, they took a half a day and we had to be able, to, we'd, we'd lose six days of shooting by shooting each of them. Yeah. Half a day of shooting per transition. So we had to tell the, the, the producers that what we were gonna do was shoot our movie in 24 days. Right. And shoot all the transitions because they had a zero page count. So I remember the risk that was taken there. This little Cinepix company eventually became this company called Lionsgate. <laughs> but this was and I guess first, it went well for them. Well, this was their first profitable movie. They actually yeah. sold it to Miramax, who then put it on a shelf and didn't release it, and just sold it to Showtime. Yeah. But but still, that's how that happened. Yeah, that's it is it is still one of my all time Thank favorite you. films. And uh, find it online, find it on Showtime. I think it's on Showtime on demand. Okay. So if if you uh, have or, that, or I think on Netflix too, and probably on Netflix. Um, oh my God, so much other stuff. I'm Let's, such a tough guest. You just get you were the talking. worst. Yeah, you, let me get a word in there. So <laughs> come on. Um, all right. I want to talk about more acting stuff, but I read a quote of yours that I, as an actor, found kind of interesting. Uh, you were 27 years old before you performed in front of the camera. Is that 27 ish? Okay. And to this day, he believes any good stage actor can do film, though the reverse is not necessarily true. I think that's just obvious. Don't you agree with that? Uh, I guess. I don't know. Look, act, film actors aren't used to doing things for more than five minutes or something. Right. I mean, you, you know, I think it's really tough for a film actor to play, uh, you know, an hour and a half. Yeah. And an hour and a half take. Yeah. You, you need training for it. Or training in the sense you don't need to go to school. I mean, you need to do it. Right. Uh, so you understand what's required. In fact, uh, there are actors, great, there are wonderful film actors who certainly have the talent and the ability to do it, but, this, but, but you know most film actors are like? They'll, they'll, most film actors who haven't done stage, mm -hmm. who do amazing performances on stage, mm -hmm. they do go through rehearsals and they go to opening night, 
Well, they, they don't realize they've got to do it seven more times this week. Right. It's over. They've done their take. Yeah. They go home now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, they know it's it, but they don't know it. It's a very different mentality, yeah. It's a mentality that very few film actors know what a stage actor knows, is that your best performance on your first week of, of acting the role, the best performance that week, is not a quarter as good as your worst performance on the last week of, mm. running, of running a play. Yeah. And what's required, you know, is uh, it's an actor's medium. Certainly, film isn't an actor's medium. No, it's a director's medium, editors, and directors. But, but, um, but no, a stage is an actor's medium. And I, I, it's not that I don't think that they they can do it. I, yeah. I just mean that a stage actor is has has to have that ability, uh, and certainly can do five minute takes. Sure. Well, that's all. All right. I, uh, there's nothing controversial about it. No, there's, it's controversial because I could never do it. That is what I consider real acting. You is, have is never done stage. stage acting? Not uh, professionally. Okay, but if you did, uh, because you do stand up and because you're on stage for a long time, yeah. and, and you also uh, have gone to classes and you know what that is, it would be scary, but you could do it. And, and you, yeah. should, you should do it. I would like to. Are you, do you have a hookup? Or? Yeah, let's, let's figure right. this out. All right, great. So that's interesting. So you, you think that you could just, well, then you probably agree with me. You can't just do it. No, you, I guess what I'm saying is, and I think maybe I, I haven't verbalized this, I've seen stage actors try to do oh, film, who, film can't, not. who can't do it. They can't get small enough because but they're then, so used to playing to the back of the room. How old are they, 80? Come on, most actors who have never done it, who are 20, who've watched film I guess, all their yeah, lives. All right. I guess it's very, mostly older actors. If they're older actors who are, I'm going to perform. <laughs> Watch this. This is wonderful. This is actually, I'm doing me. <laughs> no, Saul, Saul is one of the older actors who was like, Jesus oh. Christ. No, but let's, certainly any actor who's been watching minimalist acting all his yeah. life. In fact, in fact, what you want to tell young actors is, yeah. Bring it up. Bring, Go bigger. Give me a take. I agree. Where it's not so internal. We've Make a choice. Small. Well, I've I've directed actors who who made who are not making choices. Yeah. What are they doing? They're uh, they're they're naturalistic. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, they're just playing kind of naturalistic. They're not making choices. What any choices? <laughs> they're just not giving you any reason to think that they're acting. Yeah. And that's the choice that they're making. No choice. Hmm. And you're going. That's far, as far as I'm concerned. You know, please make a choice. I don't care if it's bad. Make choices, and and but that's just non-acting. Yeah, that's fine. That's a whole different art. You know. I guess you are right. No, I'm is, not no, trying to be right. I just no, no, no. You're absolutely right. It is a very. But different... certainly, there are actors from stage. You have to bring them down in scenes, and you yeah. say, you know, this is all reading. You're you're you're, you're acting as if this is a 400 seat theater. It's a one seat theater. Mm. The seat is right in front of you. Yeah. So you got to tell actors how what size they're doing. You know. Yeah. I just wish uh, I could work with Clint Eastwood more because really the whole taking notes thing, it's just starting to get to me. Um, I don't want to completely ignore our, our online viewers. Uh, let's see. I will say this. About 90% of the things that people have written in are all about Warehouse 13. That's so nice. we are going to have to talk about that. Uh, no true romance? No so, oh, there's plenty wants... of true romance. That's, that's from me and also from them. Somebody wanted to know if, in True Romance, uh, was the line, I'll have you fucking killed uh, in the script or not? No. Did not think so. No, because I had just read a newspaper, an article. Now I've seen that his name has gone right out of my head. Good, because I'd be sued. <laughs> there was, a, there was a, 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 an article about a, 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 a studio executive talking to a writer, yes. saying, I will have you fucking killed. I, I, have, I have people on the street. Were his I'll initials J.S.? Joel Silver? No, it wasn't oh, okay. Joel Silver. <laughs> it wasn't Joel Silver. Okay. In fact, that's a Joel Silver story. I've got a Joel Silver story. Oh, good. No, he was, he's, he's a producer, not a studio executive. Yeah. Joel Silver is a, is a producer. Oh, yeah. He's a no, this was a studio executive, okay. a very famous one, whose name's gone out of my head now. Seriously, eh, I, I don't care. I'd say, eh, fine. but he told a writer, what do you mean? You're. Not, I'll have you. I have people on the street. I'll have you fucking kill. I couldn't <laughs> believe that line. And and a car, cut me off while we were shooting in in uh, Malibu. Yeah. And I just improvised. Oh my and god. And said, "Don't give me the finger. I'll have you yeah. fucking killed." That was just. We we Tony let us improvise a lot. Oh, that's great. And uh, I'm not sure. You know, 
whether Tarantino would have, because he'd written such a great oh, script, but oh, he wasn't he would. there. Maybe he would. So he was. I can assure you. you. Can assure I him. speak firsthand for that. You, yeah, I wish I'd, I'd never met him. And uh, but that was, that was uh, yeah no a lot of improvised lines. Oh, oh that's oh, great. A lot of a lot of uh, improvised lines. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, and 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 I don't know if you've seen Inglorious Bastards. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, but that's what you worked with. Yeah, the, the the character of Donnie Donowitz, played by Eli Roth. It's his uncle, I believe. Oh, it's his uncle. Okay, I believe I it's his uncle. Because I, I talked to Quentin about this one day, um, on the, day, the first day we started. I didn't want to ask him after I'd read the script when I was still meeting with him trying to get the part, because God forbid I asked the wrong thing. But uh, once we got to set, I said, so what's the uh, Lee Donowitz, Donnie Donowitz connection? I said, it can't be his dad, can it? Because uh, I figured uh, Donnie Donowitz was too young. He hadn't fathered any kids yet. And spoiler alert, he doesn't make it yes, to the he end of the movie. Make it, so he may not so have I figured it must have been maybe his younger brother's well, no, kid. I'd be old enough. I mean, just about, because it was 91 or 2. Right. And if I was born in, if he had fathered anybody, it would have been 44. 44, yeah. No, I was, I was younger a than little 50. Young. Yeah, yeah so 45. I would look like I was in my 30s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I, I believe he said, no, nah, it's his younger brother's kid. And you know, and then you think, uh, so the whole Donowitz family that's very interesting wound up in war because in true romance you say uh, you know my uh, my my every every all the veterans I know from the this bullshit war you know from yeah Vietnam. that's right that's right uh, so it's the whole Donowitz family fought you never heard the audition story? I've got an audition story please tell me it's an audition story for true romance so um, you got to remember that it was a new thing that Tarantino did. It was just, uh, yeah. Nobody had combined that kind of violence with that kind of humor. Yeah. At least not in American cinema. Yeah. Uh, that kind of grand guignol, very o o you know, over the top kind of blood, violence, and humor. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was an unusual script. And um, I got an audition, and I, I don't remember whether, the, I knew the casting director, it was Risa Brayman, was a friend of mine, and, and I got in to meet Tony Scott, the late, great Tony Scott, and uh, who I'd never met before. And I started doing the scene. And I didn't know Tony's sense of humor yet. I didn't know who he was. And, and, he, and he stopped me halfway through the, my audition. He said, it's great. It's great. You, you, got, you got him exactly wrong. Oh, my God. You got him exactly right. It's just perfect. A couple of things. I'll give you a couple of pointers. Can I give you a couple of pointers? And I'm going, you sure? Because sure. Um, you got him. I mean, it's Joel 2AT. And the character's name is Lee, right? Uh, but, but there's a few things about him I can tell you would be slightly different. And I'm, OK. And he starts doing this imitation of this guy. And I said, wait, wait can I ask Tony, who's Joel? Oh, Joel Silver. Well, you know, the role is based on Joel Silver. I mean, you're doing him. I just did The Last Boy Scout with him as a producer. He's a fire nightmare. But, you know, he's, he's, <laughs> uh, but, but you're doing him, and you're doing him great. It's just a couple of things that I'd like you to, to try. Is that right? And I said, well, frankly, no. I mean, I, I, honestly, I don't know who Joel what Sil Silver is. I don't know who that is. Uh -huh. I'm not doing an imitation of jo anybody called Joel Silver. For, for for sad as it might seem, this is me. I'm doing this guy that this is in me, I guess. Yeah. I'm doing me, <laughs> a version of me. Yeah. And and now you, a Cockney, are doing an imitation of somebody, and I'm supposed to do an imitation of you doing an imitation of him, uh -huh. who, who I don't know. And I think what you really need is somebody from Second City who knows how to do this stuff, and not me. Oh. You know, I yeah. really don't know how to do that. Bold. Well, it was true, and I was irked a little bit. Yeah. Because uh, I really didn't know how to do an imitation of him doing an imitation of, of some, if it was a famous person, even then it would be hard enough to do it. So I don't do the imitations. I don't know how to do them. I'm not good at them. And, and then, jokingly, but I didn't think it was a joke. Yeah. He turned to casting and he said, I thought you said he wanted this part. And I, was, I saw red. <laughs> and I said, hey, not at any fucking price I don't. I got up. I mean, that was a horrible thing to say. I thought you said he wanted. He was kidding, but I didn't know that. Yeah. I said, not at any fucking price. I don't. And he said, that's him. <laughs> and he cast me pretty much on the spot. Wow. I still really. I was walking around going, what just happened? You know. Wow. That's a funny story. Right? That's crazy. Yeah, it's a crazy story. 
Um, so I got that role because I was furious and angry. And, and it worked for and you. It worked for me. As they say, use it, use yeah. it. Well, I was furious. I was just, what the fuck is he wants me to be a yeah. whore? I'm not gonna fucking be a whore and kiss his uh. ass to get this role and yeah. do something I don't know how to do. I'm yeah. angry. And he, he, he just thought it was funny. And once again, you was, find yeah. yourself in a movie with a climactic shootout at the end. Yes, once again. <laughs> Going down the list of, of your resume. Deaths, of my deaths. It's I died in a fridge once. You know. oh. and, and, and the note that was pinned to me as they found me in the fridge was, I just wanted to see if the light went out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did it? <laughs> Never so. left to tell. Um, all right. Let's talk about one of my, uh, a Rod Lurie movie called The Contender. Mm. Uh, now, the Kevin Pollack, who uh, is usually here, and is, uh, I'm- I'd I worked with Rod. I want to apologize that we haven't spent more of this interview talking about Kevin. Oh, okay? yeah. Which is part of the deal But we're I back host. to Kevin now. Yes. Uh, Kevin was in Rod's uh, previous movie called with, Deterrence. With Tim Hutton? Yeah, where Kevin played the President of the United States. Yeah. And then Rod followed that up with a little movie called The Contender, mm. which uh, was tonally a little bit different. Mm. And, uh, and, and uh, I guess my, one of my favorite things about that movie, The Contender, is such a, a, a yet another amazing performance from, as my family likes to refer to him, the magnificent Gary Oldman. Mm. Uh, and I know you had a little bit of stuff with Gary, or didn't A little bit. Oh, yeah, a little bit, bit of yeah, stuff, yeah. if I'm remembering correctly. A great actor, yeah. I mean, that set, talk about the heavyweights on that set. Yeah, what, it was. Any, anything stand out? Or was you know, it, it was a, a great script. Great it, was, it, it was really a really, it was a, it was a beautifully written script. It's, it was just great to be, uh, I wish I had more to do with Jeff, because, uh, you know, I had worked with him years before and against all odds, mm -hmm. and I just admire him. So much. He's just a great actor, and he's a great actor to watch. Uh, it really is kind of like watching the Zen of acting. His mm -hmm. behavior, ability to be calm on a set, what he's able to do on a set is wonderful. I'd never met Gary before, oh. and Gary was is, is consummate. I mean, Gary is has the ability to to do accents that are not like just American accents; they're regionally specific yeah. Amer uh, accents. His ears, and then they're gone. He never his ear is amazing, and he yeah. he. He really inhabited that role and gave it gave that right wing uh, cardboard character a, a fourth dimension and created a, a real depth to it. Um, it was a it was you know Rod's an extremely talented writer. I think he's about to start a new series, um, and uh, you know he's really really interesting. And that that was that was a script that was put together very quickly, written quickly and financed quickly. Really? Uh, oh, you uh, never uh, know. Yeah, it was done. It was done in. A, it was just the script just sang to actors and. It was great to be a part of it, yeah. Oh, well, that one is definitely available on multiple yeah, streaming yeah. platforms, uh -huh. so if you have not seen The Contender, check that one out. Um, all right, we're going to talk about Warehouse 13, but to lead us into talking about Warehouse 13, uh, I want to find out what you have lovingly referred to as schmacting. 101. Uh, well, <laughs> I... <laughs> Oh, if I hit a nerve? No, it's just it's just We've been going back, so uh, well. No, no, it's just schmacting was um, schmacting is, is uh, different from um, it's different. There's different kinds of uh, of acting. Now, what, what was the one we called? It was facting. Okay. It was acting, facting, and schmacting. I see. Facting is what I was given because I had all the exposition. And, sure. And they just threw it at me because I had a good memory and I could do it and I could spill it off. Yep. And somebody had to explain what the fuck was going on. <laughs> of course. And so Saul will explain what's going on. <laughs> And he's got five minutes, and so that's called facting. And you've got to figure out how okay. to do facting so it doesn't look like facting. And the best way is to have Alison Scagliotti with you so you can pretend it's a discussion. Perfect. And then you can do facting. Schmacting is when you've got a green screen. Ah. And you know, schmacting is acting schmacting, because schmacting is what we invented when we said, okay, what are we doing today? A lot of schmacting, which meant the creatures are not there. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is what most actors have to do now. Right. They, whatever they've got, whatever they're wearing, whatever they're supposed to see, the yeah. set is a piece of green thing, and eventually you're on a skyscraper doing schmacting. I call it schmacting. And you have nice. to be good at acting, facting, and schmacting. Ooh, a real you triple to, You have to be really good at all those yeah. things, yeah. They should have yeah. schmacting schools. They you really Schmacting should. 101. Yes. That's you what you said. A green we room. teach schmacting 101. It's a green room. And you're acting with somebody <laughs> who knows what they're doing. Just pretend that they know what they're doing. They don't. Okay. They've never acted before. Schmacting. Go. 
some 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 creature that you're working. That with. really should be a class in, in acting schools yes. now. And how to talk to your agent? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So, um, so you played Artie Nielsen. I did. Uh, I had the the magnificent honor of, of playing your your son in the last episode. In the last episode, yeah, the very last episode. Well, of people Warehouse. didn't even know he had a son. That's right. It was it was quite the reveal. Oh, if fun. you're just catching up on Warehouse, like streaming it online, and you haven't gotten to the end, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that was fun. That was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. And and you guys did that six seasons on that. Five seasons. Or five seasons. Uh, five seasons. So yeah, over was, six years. Was yeah, that what it yeah, is? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we shot a pilot, a two-hour pilot, and then the next year we started our okay. five-year five-year run. Um, and uh, boy, what a fun fun gig! I that did, was. wasn't expecting to have such a great role at that point in my career, and it was it was really lucky, and partly because um, Jack Kenny, who was running the room and was the head writer, was such a. Uh, uh, a delight, and also because he was there. And, and for those actors who know what it's like to work on a series where the head writer, the showrunner, is not there. Right. They're uh, 3,000 miles away in, yeah. in a writer's room, and you can't make changes. You can't. It's very, very difficult yes, on most it shows. Is. Yes, it is. Um, you know, because you get to the set and it's not the same, and you, there's all these edicts. Well, what Jack did, which was unusual, and collaborate, and it's a money issue. And it's a money issue because of this. In order to be able to be available, to be able to come to a set, you have to have uh, scripts ready. Well, they're never ready. Mm -hmm. But he got the network and the studio to agree to start to pay for the writers to start early. Mm. So that meant that there were six scripts ahead, five or six scripts ahead, which meant that by the time we started shooting, we were, there were already five scripts in the bank. Or so, yeah. and everything had been broken story-wise, yeah. so that he would have the ability to come from LA to Toronto and be there, because Jack Kenny was there, yes, and because he could see, and because he used to be an actor, and because he could see what was going on with actors fucking around on a set or improvising or having difficulty with this moment or that, and because he had uh, also the overview of the show mm -hmm. in his in his head, he was able to be on the set and say, go with that, yeah, or change it to this. You don't like it, let's change that. Yeah. And so actors who came as guest stars, like you and other people went, this is kind of freeing, because normally you come on as a guest star, as you know, mm -hmm. going on a show, uh, you didn't dot that I. <laughs> I think you said ah instead of the, and you've got the script supervisor says, I'm really sorry, but they're very strict about this, and you go, yep. okay, what did I say? Okay, and you and, and that's the just that's the gig, mm -hmm. and you know that that's the gig. Yes, particularly then, if you're on a David E. Kelly show. Is that right? Oh boy. Okay, so when when we when we when actors who came on Warehouse were free, and they could fuck around and say, "I'm this isn't working for me," or Jack would go, "Is this the writing or you?" You go, "What do you mean?" Well, uh, something's wrong with this, and I have a feeling yeah. it's the writing. You know, can I could, let fit it to your mouth, fit it fit it so it works for you. Yeah. And that, that's what happened on that show. And it's evident level. when you watch it that that's kind of what was going on. Yeah, and I had a great group of actors to work with and great material, and it was a great role, and, uh, and it was really fun. It was a really fun five years. Yeah. I have nothing to complain about. No, it was, it was yeah. a, a very fun gig for me. Toronto's a great city. Of all, of all the cities you could have gotten sent to True. to shoot in. My old hometown where yeah. I did theater, yeah. That's, 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 that worked out pretty yeah, well for you. It did. Um, and I know uh, the popularity of the show. I know we were talking beforehand. Sometimes you go on the road and you do appearances. Yes, and along with other actors. Uh, because sci fi, that genre, leads to the. There's, there's probably. I don't know if, if this is accurate, but I'm going to guess that there is a sci fi ish convention every weekend of the year, somewhere in the world. That is. Almost certainly true. Right? Yep. Because look at the birth of Comic-Con and how big it grew to hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people. But you, yeah. So somewhere. Uh, so I'm going to be in Knoxville, for example, on, around June 5th or so. Okay. And we're, I'm going to go to Dublin and, and to Malmo, Sweden, and to Glasgow in the fall. And there are conventions where, yeah. where you can go and fans, and you get to, to meet fans, and you get to make a little bit of money. Absolutely. Uh, and you, and it's it's great, especially if you still got somebody in college, kid in college. <laughs> Absolutely. And a, and, uh, and a mortgage. And if you're in the Omaha area, uh, two that's weeks from now, going? that's where I'll be. <laughs> so I'll see On you a farm. At, at O Comic Con <laughs> in uh, near the Iowa Omaha border. Uh, okay, uh, one last thing. This one's just for me. Undercover Blues. Uh, Dennis Quaid, yeah, no, Kathleen I remember Turner. The movie. Yeah, wow. Pulling stuff out of I'm my sorry, hat. man. That was. Uh, you know, I have very few memories. I tell you what, my memory of under it's not going to okay. be what you want to hear because no, it's anything. Anything. It has is nothing what I to hear. do with That's acting. Fine. 
it had to do with my being in um, in New Orleans in August. Oh. Where, it rains, where it rains every day for an hour. When it's then. not 100 degrees with humidity. 100, at least. Yeah. And you're going out, immediately you're drenched. Yeah. And then you, as soon as you go in, it's 23 degrees. <laughs> and and you're freezing wherever you went. Yeah. And Hannah, who is 24 now, was just months old. Uh, she was a little baby. And I remember, you know, we took her everywhere, to all the jazz clubs, and she would be her little carrots listening to jazz. And she was always covered in talcum powder because of <laughs> the heat. <laughs> just... Uh, and, I, and I, we, were, we had a, an incredible week. We brought a friend with us to help out. And we had the money because we I was on a movie shoot. Mm -hmm. So the friend could get paid to be with us and get a holiday in New Orleans. I never shot a day. <laughs> Not one day. <laughs> Not one day, no. One day. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so that was, um, that was uh, really funny. What was the name of the director? Uh, Herb Ross. Yes. Uh, okay, here's, a, here's a, a one actor story. Okay. Just one actor. Okay, Herb Ross is famous for directing musicals, right? Big musical, Funny Lady or whatever, I think. Big Sounds musicals. right. And I remember getting really pissed off at him. So I remember getting, being in a blocking session, and his hands would move here and I'd move here. I, mean, I remember going, Herb, actor, not dancer. <laughs> Herb, <laughs> what, what? Actor, not dancer. Are we clear? Oh, no, oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I remember, remember being so fucking curious. <laughs> Spin! Spin! Yep. What the hell is going on with this guy, you know? It reminds me of Bob Barker. On I used to watch The Price is Right as a kid. And Bob Barker always used to do this thing that always irked me as both an actor and a human being. He, manhandle he people? would manhandle people. It would, people would come up onto the stage, and if they weren't tilted just right for the camera, oh, move them. he would grab them. Oh, no, come over here, just stand right there, and you're good. And then they'd tilt a little, and up, 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 right back there. And he always with the microphone and tilt them and no. That's and why here he got the big step. money, man. That's that, yeah, yeah right there. Have to learn how to do that. And I would always say, don't just say, come over here. And then I realize, as a grown up now, having worked with actors, no, you have, you have to manhandle people. I think what's great yeah. about Undercover Blues. Yeah is the introduction to the public of a great actor, Ooh. Stanley Tucci. Ah. See, I don't think Stanley was known. No, he was not. And I think it was, uh, to, even though you know, I'm making fun of Herb Ross, uh, it was Herb Ross who saw how talented Stanley was. Yes. And I don't think Stanley was a known actor. Absolutely right? not. That was the very Wasn't first it, thing I remember he, seeing him And he in? played El Muerte. And, uh, yep. you know, and he played the, the bad guy in yep. that movie. Uh, yep. not, a, not a movie that a lot of people saw. No, the only thing I'd ever seen him in before was Quick Change, the Bill okay. Murray movie. And okay. he had a small, small part, part in that, but this but was, he a, was he was a big and part. And he was playing a meaty, big, yeah, over-the-top, yeah. So ridiculous... So that's what that movie should be famous for. Absolutely. It was introducing a great Stanley Tucci to people. Yeah. Absolutely. Ooh. And, uh, and what, what more can we ask for than a great Stanley Tucci? Yeah. And what more can I ask for than the great Saul Rubinick? Um, I have taken far too much of your time on you this You have, except you want me to do one other thing. You do. You, I cannot let you leave without playing the Larry King game. I will remind you of the rules one more time. Yes. You're going to do a bad Larry King. I don't care. Yeah. This is not a Joel yeah. Silver situation. Yeah, yeah. Larry King can sound like anything you want no, him to yeah, sound yeah. like. It's My bad. imagination of Larry King. Perfect. As Larry, mm. you are going to give us a little TMI moment, a little aside, something going through Larry's crazy Stone Age mind. Mm. Uh, it could be about anything, it could be long, short, whatever. And then after this little aside, he throws Thank to you. the phones, and if it happens to be a funny sounding city that he goes to all Doesn't the he better. Wear glasses? He does yeah, wear I'll, glasses. Give me those glasses. Can't Dr. Chen. Yes. The ones you're wearing. He's <laughs> looking around for He's looking glasses. around. Come on, he needs the, the man who needs, needs his Larry. props. That's all when I know. When you are ready, yeah. that is your camera. What the hell? Well, I've been given here. Uh, hi. Uh, just uh, as an aside, uh, I'm not used to getting these. I usually know all this stuff. They're handing me this at the last uh, minute, and I'm supposed to interview. Uh, I'm supposed to interview. Usually, I, 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 I'm, I'm interviewing people that I know. Now I'm supposed to interview Rubinek. Rub Rub <laughs> I don't know what that is. From my, everything that I understand, his career is, says his acting career is over. As far as I know, it's over. I don't think he's worked in I don't remember seeing him. 
character actor, and I, it shows you the state of my career <laughs> that I have to interview people like that, whose names, uh, not even his real name. Apparently, he's the real name is Jim Scott. He's not Jewish. <laughs> he, he says here that he changed his name to Saul Rubinick uh, because he looks Jewish and wanted to work. <laughs> I'm going to go, go back to in time to Warsaw. Go to the uh, <laughs> just before the Holocaust, we're going to talk to Saul Rubinick's parents on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Larry is angry, confused, and apparently has access to time travel. <laughs> that is, that is, and there, that's how you play the Larry King game. There really are no, no, no hard rules. and fast rules. Right. Uh, Kenny, I'm going to keep your glasses. Uh, you're going to get these back at the end of the day. Oh, dear Kenny. You can't see. Yeah. No, that is blinding. Um, I'm worried about you. I'm concerned right now. This is all just a blur, I'm sure. Um, I will wrap things up. Uh, uh, I, I, will not take, I will not take a lot of time. Saul, I honestly, from the bottom of my heart, yeah, can't thank you, thank you. Uh, enough for, fun, for coming here and chatting with me. And now we have to work together again. We somewhere. really do. So I, both of us could take one role away from Kevin, I think. Just one. <laughs> he can't be available all, all the time. The time. No. That's, I play the older Kevin, you play the younger Kevin. That's how I sneak in. That's how we get some work. Um, that is, that is uh, more than anyone can ask for from you, Saul. Thank you so much. Yeah, it really means a lot. Uh, okay, that's it. That is, that is our show. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, Kevin will be back at some point. I don't know. I if think he's, he's not working. Yeah. If he's not working on the Gervais movie in Toronto or the Bruce Willis movie somewhere else. Oh, man. Um, well, we will see you soon. I don't know if there's going to be a show next week, but I think there'll be one after that. Either way, until next time, fuck off. <laughs>